let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 12. And let me remind you of something that we started last week. We started last week a series entitled, Were You Ready? And now that's a really good question because something has just happened in our world and a lot of us are asking ourselves, was I ready for this? Could I have been more ready in faith for protection, in faith for healing, financially? Could I have been more ready for this thing that I didn't see coming? Could I have been more ready spiritually? Could I have been more ready physically? Could I have been more ready financially? And I know me in my life, I was a little bit surprised about a couple things that happened and I wasn't quite as ready as I wanted to be in some of these areas. But I want to show you from the scriptures that it's very important to be ready, which simply means what you do when the skies are blue is vital because when the clouds start rolling in is not the time to get ready. We need to live ready because we don't know exactly what's going to happen around the corner. God will reveal some things to us, don't get me wrong, but this thing seemed to have taken a lot of us by surprise. Whoever thought two, three, four million people would be out of work in a couple weeks time? Whoever thought, you know, that toilet paper would be gone from the shelves of the supermarket and the meat section, you know, gone. I mean, whoever, who would have thought, was anybody ready for this? I, I kind of think this might be some kind of a, whoa, we better wake up here. I mean, the enemy did something. Some evil forces did something. Were we ready or were we not ready? We're, I'm thankful we're getting through it. God's merciful and gracious, but I'm asking myself the question, was I ready? And I'm also telling myself something before the next thing happens, I will be way more ready. Amen. You know, we've read some things in the book of Revelation and other things that talk about the end times. We thought, oh, that's not for us. That's for somebody else. We won't even be here. Well, we were here for this. And the Bible says in the last days, perilous times are going to come. That's not just talking about when the church is raptured. That, there's some things, there's something called the beginning of sorrows Jesus talked about that was going to come on the earth to show that the bigger things are on the way. Now, I do believe we'll be out of here when the terrible things hit, but right now we need to be ready for whatever's coming and thank God if we're in the Word, praying and going to church, we're going to be ready. So I want to read you Luke chapter 12 and I want you to notice verse 39 and a part of verse 40. Luke chapter 12 verse 39 and part of verse 40. And actually, this is in connection with the end times, the days we're living in. So it says in verse 39, Jesus is teaching. He says, This know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered or allowed his house to be broken through. Be you therefore ready also. For the Son of Man comes in an hour when you think not. So the Lord's talking here about being ready. Now in the verse 39, He's talking about being ready for things that happen in the earth. Happenings that maybe we're not 100% aware of. It's just better to be ready. Right guys? Then if, we, then if something does quote unquote catch us by surprise, the surprise is too late. We're ready. We live ready. We're always built up. We're always praying in the Spirit. We're always going to church. We're always seeking God. We are separate from the world yes. system. You know, talk the, the way they're going. We're separate from that. And if you live like that for the next 11 to 12 months, if something does happen in a year or two from now, you're going to be totally ready. Friends, you need to understand this. Storms are going to come. Problems are going to happen. In the last days, perilous times shall come, the Holy Spirit said. They're going to happen. And our goal is not to stamp out all bad times or all storms. Our goal is to simply be ready for them so when they come, it doesn't touch us. We stay above it. We're protected from it. The goal is not no more storms because another one's going to come. The goal is live your life in such a way where you live like Jesus above the storm. We don't deny the storm, but you can get above the storm. We don't deny there's problem, but it doesn't have to come on you. Amen. Come on, say this. The problems of this world do not have to come upon me. Say it again. The problems of this world do not have to come upon me. Now listen, our goal is not to stop all problems. Our goal is to see to it that they don't come on us. That's why Psalm 91 says when all these plagues and all this pestilence and all these demonic things are happening in the world today, it says a thousand will fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come near you. So
So the goal is not getting rid of all the bad in the world. Bad stuff's going to happen in this fallen world until Jesus comes. The goal is seeing that you're in a place where it can't come on you. And if you want a really great key to what I'm talking about right now, Job chapter 3 verse 25 says, Job said after, after some deaths in his family, some terrible things happened with weather and, and uh, robbers and sickness had come upon his body. He said, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me and that which I was afraid of has happened unto me. Friend, listen, he said it came upon him because he was greatly afraid. If you don't want this stuff coming upon you, numero uno, don't be afraid of it coming upon you. Don't be afraid of it getting a hold of you. It's this invisible thing. A lot of people don't voice it, but on the inside, they're just in torment thinking, I hope I don't get sick. I hope I don't. Oh, what if I die? What if I die? I don't, what am I? don't be afraid. First key, don't be afraid. Job said the thing I greatly feared. Yeah, it was in the world. Yeah, it was all around me, but it came on him. It may be around us, but it doesn't have to come on us. So let's just say, fear, I resist you in Jesus' name. I refuse to fear. My Father God has not given me the spirit of fear. There's spiritual influence involved with fear, but He's given me, God's given me the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Learn to quote that scripture all the time. Um, so let's do this now. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Um, so Jesus is talking about being ready. If the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would have broken in, he would have watched and been ready and stopped it before it happened. Protected his stuff in a higher way. And so I'm talking, that's what we're talking about today. So the big question is, were we ready for this? And we may like or not like the answer that we have to truthfully respond. But how about for the next challenge? Pastor, do you think there'll be another challenge? I don't think there will. I know there will, guys. The Bible says, oh, we're going to read it right here. In the last days, difficult and dangerous times are going to come. And really, that's not the big issue. The big issue is, are you going to be ready for the next challenge? The big deal is not the storm. Oh, look at the storm. Oh, look at the storm. Oh, the problem. Oh, the virus. Oh, that great mighty storm. Oh, the no, the biggest problem is people just flat out aren't ready. And Jesus tells us how to be 100% ready for anything that happens in the earth realm. David talked about, though the mountains be moved into the sea and the, sh and the earth shake and quake. I'm not going to fear. I'm in the Lord. He's our protector. He's our strengthener. He's our shield. He's our comforter. Call him that, people. Call him that. Don't just read it. Call, use the Bible. Don't just read the Bible. Speak scriptures. I, I'm getting a little passionate about this because I see, still see people afraid and, and they don't know what to do. But we're here to tell you what to do. Read your Bible. Go to church. Pray and you will know what to do specifically if you do those general things right there. So now 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now this might shock some of you what Paul says here. And can I just do a little disclaimer right here? I didn't write this. Uh, another preacher didn't write this. So if you have a problem with what I'm reading right now, um, you're going to have to talk to the author of it, which is the Holy Spirit. Through the Apostle Paul said these words, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. He said, this know also. Should, should we know this? I mean, if the Bible says know this, we better know this, right? This know also that in the last days, perilous or difficult, dangerous times shall come. Now stop right there before we go to verse 2. We are told to, you can keep the scripture up just for a second. I want to see a little longer. We are being forewarned here so we could be forearmed. Or in other words, so we could be ready. Everybody say, I'm going to be ready. Hey, Troy, if you're watching, Troy Salazar, I think I want to take you up on that idea. Last week, Troy texted me and said, we should get a shirt that says, we will be ready. Amen. We will be ready. Well, if you want to be ready, you just have to be consistently doing a few certain things. And it's all wrapped up in loving God more than anything or anyone. But there's a few consistent things you need to do if you want to be ready. The Bible tells us right here, forewarns us, so we'll be forearmed, that in the last days, and we are in the last of the last days, to be honest with you. We're in the end of the end. Last days actually started 2,000 years ago. Peter said they were in the last days then. Well, we're in the last of the last days now. Simply meaning the rapture of the church is about to happen, the catching away of the saints. And the son, uh, man of sin is going to be revealed. All kinds of hell is going to break loose on the earth. Jesus is going to come back with us. And there's going to be a brand new earth after he cleans everything up. But we're in the end of all things right now. And so we know perilous times 
are going to happen. And that shouldn't make us afraid, numero uno, because even death doesn't scare us. Because to depart and be with Christ is far better. It's almost like you've got to get over the fear of death before you can even receive healing properly. You can't be afraid. Fear, fear is just not of God. And so we know that in the last days, difficult times are going to come. Now, he's going to list some difficult times in these next few verses. And I want you to look at them. It's going to be like you're reading the news today. It's, it's quite interesting how Paul knew this 2,000 years ago. Verse 2. Here's what the difficult times are. You ready? Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Can I get an amen? <laughs> hey, if you find yourself having done are doing any of these things that this, these next few verses list, good news, you can stop doing them with the help of the Lord. You can repent, be totally forgiven, and God will even forget that, he, that, that you ever even did it. And you can get right into the things of God, move strong in the church, find your place, work for God, be rewarded in the next life, go to heaven when you die. So even if you see yourself in some of these verses, know this, God loves you, he has mercy, He has grace, and you can come out of these things, be totally forgiven, have no record you even done them in God's mind, and go on as a clean, royal person. So here he says, in the last days it's going to be perilous because men are going to be lovers of their own selves. How many of that's going to create some problems? Selfishness is the beginning of so many problems. He said, perilous times, men would be covetous. Gotta have this, gotta have that, gotta have this, gotta have that. You know, we tell the people in the church here all the time that God's not opposed to His children being rich. He's opposed to them being covetous. God's not opposed to people being wealthy. He's opposed to them being covetous because covetousness hurts. The Bible never said money is the root of all evil. The Bible said the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, had erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But He said in the last days there'd be a bunch of covetous people, boasters. Look at me. Look at me, look at me, the star, I'm the star, I'm the star. Proud, there'd be a big increase of pride in the last days. In the last days, blasphemers. So, you know, I'm thinking about these things and I'm looking around, I'm going, you know, why am I surprised? Paul said it was going to happen. Why am I surprised that people are blaspheming today? On the evening news, to millions of people. Why am I surprised? Paul said these things were going to happen. He said, in the last days, there'd be a rise of disobedience to parents. In other words, rebellion. I'm going to do whatever I want, mom and dad. I don't need no authorities. Insubordinate. Rebellion. It's a sign of the last days, a, a rise of it. He said, in the last days, people would be unthankful. I just tell you, I, I, you know, to complain about a little problem over here, but to be able to see is absolutely ridiculous. How about we forget about complaining about the little stuff and thank God our retinas are attached. You know, there are blind people in the world today. Are you thankful you can see? Yes. Instead of complaining about the things we don't have, let's thank God for the things we do have. But in the last days, it said people would be so on edge and just so unthankful, unholy. You know, holiness is not a very popular message. And I'll tell you another message that's not real popular, but it's powerful. And that is repentance. Turning away from things we know are wrong. Turning away from things we know are compromising. Turning away from things we're not sure if the Lord's pleased with. If you're not sure about it, leave it alone. We shouldn't be involved with anything that we're not 100% sure Jesus is pleased with. Because whatever's not of faith or persuasion is sin. We need to watch out. You know, we're going to read 2 Chronicles 7, 14 again. It's a scripture for the day. But the Bible talks about the church, uh, God's people have the cure for this virus. Did you know that? God, God's people, He said, if my people do something, your land will be healed. Yeah. God's got a cure for the virus. Yeah. God has a cure for the virus. Yeah. And God's people have that cure. And it's in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. So this is a list of things, and we're not done yet, but this is a list, list of things that Paul said by the Holy Spirit would be happening in the last days. Now, verse 3. He said, part of this perilous times is people would be without natural affection. I didn't write this. I love the Bible. But let's say somebody is involved in something that includes unnatural affection. 
What, 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 what's, what, what should they do? Well, number one, realize that it's something the Lord doesn't want you involved with. And number two, he has the power to get you out of it. Number three, he will totally forgive you for anything you've done. And number four, you can go on like it never happened. So what is natural affection? Well, it's, it's things going against nature. I mean, this is New Testament. These are things that are going against nature. And, and I know, I know there's, there's people hooked and, and, and entwined in these things. But God could unhook you. Right. Well, I tried. and well, well, I went to the church and they didn't help me. Maybe you went to the wrong church. I don't know. But you can be free from unnatural affection. You can be free from wanting things that are against nature. You can. There's things called deliverance and prayer and getting, you know, you can get so full of the Word of God, just flush everything out of you that's not right. It may take a little burning the minado, but if you want to pass life's test, you might have to do what you did in college, just burn the minado. If you're going to pass their test, you might have to pass some of life's test by burning the minado. Get in the Word. Listen to sermons. Because you can get free from anything, church. You can get totally free from anything that's coming against you. If it's unnatural stuff, and you know what's against nature, come on. I mean, a three-year-old knows what's against nature. Right? Unnatural things are a sign, a rise in unnatural things. People being involved with unnatural things is a sign that we're in the last days. Paul said, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Then he says another thing is truce breakers, people who don't keep their word, false accusers, a lot of blaming, incontinent, fierce, that's terrorism, despisers of those that are good, that's going on, traitors in the last days, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And I like what one translation says, and you can, you can go on the screen now, you can take the scripture off. One translation talks about denying the power to get free from these previous things. Well, I just, this is who I am and there's just no way I can get free. That's denying the power of God. Come on, there's power to fix anybody. But pastor, I was born this way. Well, you can be born again. And it's a real birth. It's not a figment of our imagination. It's being born of the Spirit. It's coming into the family of God. It's your insides becoming brand new. And since all life comes from your spirit, it can change your soul and change your body. Get born again, and you can see these other areas of your life start to change and shape up by the life of God that comes in you when you're born again. Friend, there's nothing you can't get free from. I know maybe not every church is teaching this, but for one thing I like about Faith Heights Church that the Lord's helped us with is we flat out believe in the power of God. We have great faith in the power of God. There's nobody too fettered that can't be free. There's nobody too bound that can't get set free. Nobody too, too low that can't be lifted up. We believe if you made your bed in the lowest hell, God's mercy can get you out of there. He can do it. He's, he's, gotten people, he's, he's gotten people out of so low. I mean, people who've caused children to pass through the fire. People who sought witchcraft and enchantments and made other people to sin worse than the heathen. Manasseh, other people, Ahab. People got delivered. People got set free because they turned to the Lord and they did hideous things. So even if you're in the lowest hell, His mercy can reach you. And I say all these things because this is just showing us that in the last days there's going to be an escalation of these perilous times and we're going to see these things increase. And we have and we're still going to. And I don't know about you guys, but I am sensing in my heart, well, I know this, we're closer to the coming of the Lord than we've ever been. <laughs> Obviously. But I, I, I don't know how much longer certain things can go on before the Lord comes and gets us. And one key to when he comes to get us is this gospel, not any gospel, not the watered down gospel, the full gospel shall be preached unto all the world. Then the end shall come. You know, uh, right along with this scripture here, I, I won't turn to it right now, but in uh, Matthew 24, 12, and you don't have to turn there, it says, in the, Jesus said in the last days before he comes back, just before he returns, this would be a sign that it's real close to the end. He said in Matthew 24, 12, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now the word love in that verse is called agape. This is a love only believers have. He's talking about believers slipping into the world in the last days 
because of the wide acceptance of iniquity. Believers, you, you and I have to be super on guard in these days. Just because 95% of the church says it's okay doesn't mean Jesus says it's okay. Just because 95% of the church says no big deal doesn't mean is not Jesus saying it's no big deal. The Bible is still the Bible. And he said, because iniquity shall abound. In other words, perversion would just be everywhere. He said the love of many would wax cold and they'd actually slip into some. Now, perversion is a real interesting word. And a lot of people don't like to think that they're involved with perversion, but there's all kinds of people involved in perversion. It's not just in the sexual area. Perversion simply means the bending of a truth. You can't pervert something that wasn't okay at first. Perversion is a bending of truth. There's a lot of bending of truth going on right now in the church and people need to recognize it's perversion and we need to get back to solid, clear, black and white biblical principles and live by them whether people think we're freaky or not. Because what matters is what does Jesus think about us? I'm telling you, this is a part of seeing things happen in our land get cleared up and fixed. If God's people would humble themselves and pray. And everybody say and. and. Oh, I know if we just pray more, everything will be great. No. There's an and in there. Seek my face. Turn from your wicked ways. Well, I'm not involved in any wicked ways. Are you involved in anything that you're not 100% sure is God's perfect will for your life? Are you involved with anything that you know in your heart is wrong? Are you involved with some things that maybe others are involved with? Because they are, you think it's okay? If we want to see a quick healing in our land, His people. This is a plural thing, not just a one-time person. Now, if I do it, I'm protected. But if we all do it, the land gets free. How many want the land free? I want the land free, not just my house. I want, every, I want as much around me free as I can get. Then it's going to take a corporate, if my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from whatever you know is not quite right. I'll hear from heaven. God said, I'll forgive your sin and I'll heal your land. Chris, there's some Christians watching right now. You know there's some things you're doing right now. You're not 100% persuaded God is 100% pleased with you doing that. How about you just let it go? For the healing of the land's sake. For the healing of your neighbor's sake. How about we just let some of these things go that, that we maybe think, oh, well, I've got a scripture over here. I've got a scripture over there. How about we go beyond, not scripture, but how about we go beyond just what we want trying to find scripture? How about we find scriptures about being sold out to God? How about we find scriptures that help us to be more loving toward God, greater help toward people. Maybe we should find consecration scriptures, take up your cross and follow me scriptures, and not just scriptures that bring us pleasure. Yeah. It's not a smorgasbord. <laughs> God wants us to have everything. And so these are, these are interesting times, perilous times, and my word to all of us that are listening, and, and, and right now myself included, is we will be ready for whatever's ahead. I'm using this time as a wake-up call. Because I wasn't 100% ready like I wanted to be in some areas. And I really believe that this is, you know, a time right now for believers to examine their hearts and see where they're really at in the faith. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let me read you a couple more things here before we close. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I want you to notice verse 12. Now, if you've been reading your chapter a day with the church... Monday through Friday. We hit on this not too long ago, a week or two ago. 2 Timothy 1.12. I want you to read this scripture with me. It says, Paul said, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Now notice, Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. Now notice this next part. Paul said, I am persuaded that he, God, is able to keep, take care of, protect and guard that which I've committed unto him against that day. All right, listen here, church. Paul said, I'm persuaded. In other words, I can have faith for God taking care of these areas of my life because I've committed those areas to him. Yeah, Do you ever wonder why God can't just take care of and guard everything in everybody's life? Because they haven't committed those areas of their life to him. Put it up on the screen one more time at back there, guys. I want you to see this again. Look at the last part of the verse. Paul said, I'm persuaded. He could have faith for something that he's already committed to God. See, his life was committed to God. His finances were committed to God. He, he, he committed his health to God, his body to God. And therefore, that gave God a right to take care of that part of his life. Notice, notice. I'm persuaded that God's able to keep that. Keep what? 
that part of my life that I've committed to him. Not just every part of my life, no matter what I do. Not just every part of my life, no matter where I go and what I watch and who I hang around and what I see and what I consume. No, God's able to guard, protect, and take care. I looked it up in the Greek. The word keep means guard and protect and preserve. God is able to take care of the areas of our life and protect the areas of our life that we have committed unto him against that day. It's very hard to believe for God to take care of a part of your life you don't use for Him ever. It's not committed to Him. You're not even looking to God for direction in that area. God, what do you want me to do with my life, my agenda, my schedule, my money, my body? What's your word say is the right way to go? What's the holy way for me to go? Because if you commit those areas of your life to the Lord, you have no problem believing He can take care of those areas of your life. Paul said, I'm persuaded that He's able to keep protect, guard, and preserve that which I've committed unto him against that day. So I encourage us all, just commit every fiber of your being to the Lord. Look to him in every area of your life. Don't just wake up and go, oh, what do I want to do today? Say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? I'll do what you want me to do. I'll love the way you want me to love. I'll get in your word. I'll pray in the spirit. I'll be kind. I'll be a giver. I'll serve in the church. I'll do my part, Lord. I'll witness to my neighbors. Every day we should have that attitude. Then as you go to work and go about your way, just keep your antenna up and be led all the time. And just live in the attitude, Lord, my life is in your hands. You've just given God a legal right to guard, protect, and preserve your life because you've committed your life to him. And it answers the question, well, who can God protect? Well, those that have committed their life and their things to him. So turn to Matthew 7. All right, I know I got to close here, but turn to Matthew chapter 7. And let me just read you this. And then um, I'm going to close with some interesting words here that my wife might not want me to say, but I'm going to. No, she's, we've talked about these things already. We just have to be sensitive when we release them publicly because there's, there's divine timing involved and we don't want to give people the wrong impression. Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27. I want to say this before you, before you go to the scripture. Let me just say this. The big problem is not the storm that hit us or the next storm that's coming. This scripture is going to teach you right here that the big problem is not being ready for the storm. Because in Christ, you can be ready for anything. I don't care if the earth shakes and the mountains be removed into the sea. You can be ready for that and it, and it not harm you or destroy you. There is a place in God, there is a way to live where you can be totally ready and fully persuaded that no matter what happens, it won't come near me and my family. Now, if the whole church gets together and what I'm talking about today, it'll be hard for it even to get in our land. Because you take, if my people, now we're talking about a broader sense of protection. And I personally don't want just my house being the only ones protected. I want everybody protected in my valley, the Grand Valley, wherever you're from, your city. So now read Matthew. Go ahead and put that up there, guys. Matthew, Jesus is teaching. He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine, he's preaching the word, and does them. Oh, that's a big key, isn't it, guys? Hearing is great. Getting excited in church is great. Saying amen is wonderful. But when church is over, it's the doers that are going to live above the storm. Look at this. If you hear and do the words of Jesus, Jesus said, I'll show you what this guy's like. He's like a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Next verse. And the rain descended. Oh, see, so there's a storm. And the floods came. Oh, there was a flood. That's a big problem. Not as big a problem as not being ready. There was floods. The, the wind blew and beat upon that house. And it didn't fall. It couldn't fall for it was founded upon a rock. <laughs> Woo! So was the storm a problem? The storm wasn't a problem to somebody who was ready. It was just an adventure in God. And when everything subsided, the man was still there and the storm was gone. It wasn't the storm was still there and the man was gone. The man was still there and the storm was gone. Go to the next verses right after that. Now, Jesus said, everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not. So both of them heard. But one of them didn't, one of them didn't do. This man who didn't do will be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. 
keep going. The rain descended, same rain. Floods came, same floods. The winds blew, same winds, beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now you say, wow, that was such a bad storm. Oh, that storm was so awful. It was so terrible. That storm was a terrible problem. Oh, that storm, oh, that storm, oh, that storm. Same storm hit the other guy, showing the storm wasn't the big problem. It was not doing the word. It was not hearing and doing the word that was the big problem. In other words, one guy was ready when the skies were blue. He was taking God seriously, taking Christianity seriously, realizing, hey, things are great right now. I, 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 but th this person didn't slip back into the world, go, everything's great. I guess I can play around a little bit. No, this person stayed with God. This person stayed on track. And when the storm came, everybody say, when? Yeah. There's no if, guys. Another storm's coming. Do you understand that? And that's not supposed to scare us and it's not supposed to freak us out at all because we are like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And no matter what storm, what flood, what wind comes our way, Jesus didn't lie. We're going to stand strong. He said this is for anybody that hears and does the word. So I encourage you, put on your mind, I'll be ready. Was I ready for this one? Maybe not, but use what you learned to get ready for the next one. What, what's the big deal if you can overcome it all? Stamp all this stuff out so nothing bad ever happens? Unrealistic. How about just be ready so no matter what happens, you're going to be A-OK. -okay. I know it puts a little responsibility in our court. I know we'd like just somebody praying for us, fix all of our problems, but somebody praying for us cannot take the place of us putting one foot in front of the other as a good soldier in Christ Jesus and living the way he's called us to live, praying like he's called us to pray. And friend, this is the greatest, most joyful, most peaceful, most fulfilling life there is. The devil's a liar. The devil is constantly saying, you sell out to God, you won't like it. It's not fun. Tell the devil to shut up. Serving the Lord means fullness of joy, peace that passes understanding, prosperity and increase, wealth and riches in your house, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Devil says, you serve the Lord, you really sell out to God and go to church and pray prayers and walk in love. You won't like it. That's a gray life. That's a lie of the devil. The exact opposite is the truth. If you want life at its fullest, follow Jesus. Get into a good Bible-believing church. Support that church. Be a part of that church. Work for the Lord. Serve God. Walk in love. And you'll tap into things this world has no idea that are even out there. I'm not surprised, guys. I'm not, I'm not that surprised that uh, certain things have happened. I mean, come on. There's a devil out there. There's demons out there. And sorry to say, there's some people that are listening to those demons. And there's some things that have happened. I, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly how our, this thing came about. Our future stuff's going to come about. I mean, you can say, well, ah, was it just some, some food in a wet market in China? Or, or does somebody you know, digitally design something? I don't know. It's possible. I and mean, people, people can develop chemicals and release them and you know, make half the world die if they want. It's possible. And why would we think things like that are so crazy... When 10, actually, I looked at last night, Carl, over 11 million babies have already been aborted since January. Why would we think somebody might be doing something else kind of slinky or crazy? And then, it's so sad when some of those babies are born and they become two or three years old. Now we got mommies and daddies saying, you know, you can be a boy or a girl, whatever you want. That's child abuse, guys. Come on. That's confusing a little mind. Come on, you don't let that little four-year-old play in the street unattended. You don't let that four-year-old drive a car. What do you think you can tell them to make such a powerful decision to alter the rest of their life? We need to raise our kids properly. So you say, well, pastor, do you think this was a conspiracy? Do you think? I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. They're already killing 10 million babies in three months. They're already teaching young kids that you can be a boy or a girl. That's confusion. That's abuse. It's wrong. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody dr drummed up some kind of chemical disease. Why would that be any weird? It's not any weirder than the other stuff. I'm not surprised. We're living in the last days. I don't know exactly what happened with this thing. I'm not 100% sure. We got people lying to us. We got people telling us lies and then trying to cover them up later. That's say, I'm glad I got the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I have the Spirit of God. He's the Spirit of truth. And I don't look to the media for truth. I may hear a few things and I'll say, Holy Ghost, is that right or wrong? And he'll tell me.